squeeze I've been told today and as we study Moses and we look to the days. So we, when we look at Moses, he was one to give the laws. And when we look at Abraham, he was the one who was made the promise. But when we look at the prophets, we're looking at a whole different kind of fish. Like Moses was the builder, but the prophets had to carry on what Moses had built. Both works of God, we recognize that, but both are very different. Before the time of Moses, Israel was a race, sojourning in an alien land, we're told, and subject to the laws of Egypt. After Moses, Israel was a nation dwelling in a country which they had conquered and which they were able to defend. The prophets had nothing to do with establishing this great work. They succeeded the work of Moses and Joshua, and their mission was simple. They were to keep Israel faithful to the law delivered by Moses. They didn't give any new laws. They didn't amend any old ones. They were the messengers of God, as God himself told Jeremiah. Since the day of your, that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt and to this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. Yet they hearken not to me, nor incline their ear. This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of their God in Jeremiah. This summary of their work is illustrated by Christ himself. In several parables, he says, the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up in times and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. His people, his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and abused the prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people, until there was no remedy, we're told in second. Christ said in the parable, there was a certain householder who planted a vineyard and hedged about it and digged a wine press and built a tower and then went up to husband. And when the time of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And we know what they did to the husbandmen. They beat one, they killed another, and they stoned another. These, brothers and sisters, were the prophets. And that's exactly how they were treated. We must remember that the writings of the prophets were inspired and that they're just as reliable as the words that were spoken by Moses and Jesus. For Jesus himself only joins always Moses and the prophets as authorities. They have Moses and the prophets that they give them, says Luke. Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill, it says in Matthew. Now we know the work of the prophets took various forms during the long time from their entrance into the land under Joshua to the rebuilding of the temple after the return of Babylon. And when we speak of the prophets, we may tend to think of the books of those few prophets that we have recorded in the Old Testament from Isaiah and Noah. But these writers, these books, are just a few of the prophets of whom God spoke and sent to Israel. The prophets actually go back to the very beginning and include many who didn't write books. That wasn't really their job. And to others that have not been preserved for us. Their primary job was to speak the words to Israel, to bring the nation back into harmony with God's laws. The prophet's primary work was the work of living the example they taught. Living the example they taught. This is important to us, because we must do exactly the same thing. The lives of the prophets were assigned to the nation. Are our lives 
to the Stanley's trials. We won't be able to look at all the trials, as Sister Claudette pointed out to me. We don't have that much time tonight. And it would fill several talks, at least. But we will touch on just a few of them. And perhaps during the year as we're doing our reading, we'll be more aware of the trials of the prophets. Let's see how many others that we can find. As I began to put some thoughts together to prepare for this talk, I thought to show that the trials the prophets went through, and then compared to the trials that we go through, thinking that I could find encouragement in those trials. Then as I began reading and researching a bit, I came to realize that what the prophets had to endure was so much more than we can even imagine. It's hard to even compare their lives to ours. How can we even relate to what they went through? That is, as it says in Ezekiel, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth, and give them warning for me. When I would say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn him, warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at my hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. So taking that into account, let us look at some of the prophets and see if we have had to endure anything like them. <laughs> Has anybody been swallowed by a big fish? Who swallowed by a big fish? Jonah, very good. How many of you have been put in stocks with your hands and feet locked in position at a public place for a day? or thrown in a muddy pit and left to die. Who's that? The adults can help. Jeremiah. Has anywhere here been commanded to walk naked and barefoot for three years? Or have you been commanded to lay on your left side for 390 days and turn on your right side for 490 days inside of the public? been told by God not to marry. Jeremiah. Or how about to marry a prostitute? Anyone? Let's see it. How about being told tomorrow your wife is going to die and you can't mourn for her? That's Ezekiel. Can you imagine the self-control that this man must have had to endure with his trial, with no tears. How about being taken, taken to a strange land and being a captive, or thrown into a lion's den, or as we just read of, a fiery furnace, or just lived on bread and water. That happened when Jezebel cut off the prophets. Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave, and he fed them with bread and water. And as we read in Hebrews, others had trials of crumont and scourgings, moreover bonds and imprisonments, stoned, sawn asunder, tempted, slain with the sword, wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented the world was not worthy. They wandered in the deserts, in the mountains, in the dens, and in the caves of the earth. Do we have anything that compares to the trials of these problems? Anything? So, let's look a little bit further. In James it says, be patient, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and have long patience for it, 
until he received it early in the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. Your hearts. That term came up so much in the shower. Your hearts for the coming of the Lord draw the time. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience. That's what they're there for us as an example. Behold, they, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job, who at the end of the Lord, the Lord is the helpful with tender mercy. The prophets are an example to us of suffering, of patience. And we need to gain the patience that they have. Let's look closer at Jeremiah and see where his trials came from. In Jeremiah 20, verse 1, it says, Now Pasher, the son of Amber, the priest, who was the chief governor, which I imagine would have made him the high priest, in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. So Pasher smote Jeremiah and put him in the stocks in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the temple. Who smote him? Who put him in stocks? Pasher. He was the tender of the house of the Lord. We would not be surprised if it was a heathen. But no, it was the high priest. It was the caretaker of God's holy temple. We find, brethren and sisters, that it is from God's own people that the prophets received their trouble. It was Jerusalem that were told to kill the prophets in Luke. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent to thee. How often would I have gathered my children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Gathers them under her wings for protection. I've actually seen that now. And it's amazing. There was a hen with one chick, and she would have gladly given her life to protect that one chick. But why did Pasher go and put Jeremiah in the socks? Because he prophesied. And who did he prophesy to? He prophesied to the people. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon this city, upon all her towns, all the evil that I pronounce against it. Because they have hardened their hearts. They have hardened their necks. They might not hear my words. The words that Jeremiah spoke were true. And the religious leaders didn't want to hear that. Now this is something you can relate to. How often have we given lectures and had no one show up? Or try to talk the truth to someone and they tell us, mm, no, that's not for me. Stop. <laughs> and we think, oh, this is just a complete waste of time. No one's listening anyway. I don't care anymore. Still follow that example of Jeremiah and the other prophets and speak the truth. For we know that if the seed is not sown, there will be no fruit. There's much work to be done, but if nothing is done, and the word is dead, is the word dead in our hearts? Jeremiah was told, Gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them. And I command thee, I command thee. These are the words of God again. Be not dismayed at their faces. He's telling Jeremiah, they're not going to listen. Don't worry about it. Lest I confound thee before them. He said, if you don't tell them what I'm telling you, then I'm going to confound you. And this is what he tells Jeremiah he has made it. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city, an iron pillar, a brazen wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against all the people of the land. I shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For one simple reason, I am with thee, saith the Lord to deliver thee. Here, brothers and sisters, is a great lesson. The promise of a divine guidance and protection is continued upon fearless proclamation of the Word of God. 
and that a prophet is afraid of proclaiming that word is of no use. And he will be confounded by God in the presence of his enemies. Christ also says in the same message, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Leave it all behind. It's of no value. Follow me. For whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever, therefore, shall be ashamed of me, whosoever shall be ashamed of me, and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father, the of the angels. There's a promise there. And there is a command. And there is also a very good explanation of what will happen at his return. And this, I think, brothers and sisters, is the lesson we need to learn from the prophets. They endured trials because they were obedient and they believed what they were teaching. We've been blessed to give the book of Lamentations so that we can really look into Jeremiah's feelings. He knew that the trials he endured were from God. We read in Lamentations 3 I am the man that has seen affliction by the love of the child. He hath led me and brought me into darkness. I'm not into life. Surely against me is he turned. He turned his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me for the mark of his arrow. He felt as he was the target. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. And I said my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. And if we stop reading right here, we might think that Jeremiah had given up, that he had no hope. And I'm sure some of us who have gone through trials may feel like this at times too. We must read on and not stop there. In verse 19, remember mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. My soul hath them in remembrance and humbled in me. This I recall in my mind. Therefore, I have hope. He had hope. It is through bitterness, suffering, and adversity that a true Israelite learns to turn to God. In verse 22, it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Do you realize that? When we rise in the same day, great is thy faithfulness. He said, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore I will hope in him. Now, Jeremiah's father's name was Hilkiah, which means, The Lord is my inheritance. How comforting is it to remember in the midst of our loss or difficulty that Yahweh is our portion for our inheritance. Jeremiah stood in the midst of a devastated city and a desolate land. All around him his friends had lost their homes, families, and communities, and possessions of every sort. The man who trusts in them has only wasted his time and guaranteed his ultimate disappointment. But the life that has God for a portion has hope and satisfaction at the last, and contentment even now at the prospect of that inheritance. We are saved as we are told by hope. This process is yet far from complete, but it is our privilege to rejoice that our portion is in the Lord's hands, and that our hope 
will surely appear at the appointed time. We must keep the vision of our hope alive in our hearts. In the back it says, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not a lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Do we have a vision of our own? No. Can we envision that? No. Just think of it. Look at that banana. No, it's a green banana. It's nice and firm. And three scoops. Three scoops. We have chocolate, strawberry. We have, oh, we have topics. Think of the caramel. Think of the chocolate. Think of the strawberries. The pineapple. And for Brother Chuck, look at all that whipped cream on top. And at last, and at last, the cherry. Can you feel it? Can you taste it? You'll probably be around Can you feel it? Can you taste it? Is this real to you? Is it real? Okay, now, look at this. Is that real to you? Can you feel it? Can you picture yourself? Can you picture yourself standing right there? Can you look around you? Can you see the trees? Can you see the water running down? Can you imagine meeting Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Christ, Moses, Paul, David. Can you imagine it? Can you hear the, the singing in the background, the instruments? Imagine peaceful. Imagine no more glasses. Imagine no more hearing aids. No more arthritis. No more diabetes. No more cancer. No more, you fill in the blank. Imagine it. Can you really that's, that's our hope. Right there. That one picture. Can you imagine yourself there? If you can, you have faith. If you cannot, you need to work on your faith. Jeremiah continues on in Lamentations. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him to the soul that seeketh him. He's made a promise. The word wait here means to wait eagerly or to crave. Do we crave that vision of the temple? Do we crave it? As I said before, we are watchmen. We watch the signs of the time. And we'll get a better lecture tomorrow night from Brother Steve, the latest events. The time is grown short. And we strive to keep our garments unspotted from the ugly world that we see outside. It is good for a man that he should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Notice this. We are to quietly wait. No murmuring. No complaining. But the patience and the self-control it would take for the prophets not to murmur or complain through everything they have to endure. And yet, we think about ourselves and how many times we complain when something simple doesn't go our way. Are we all guilty? Are you guilty? The 27th verse, it is good for a man did he bear the yoke in his youth? The youth is a time for establishing lifelong ambitions and habits. It's a time for high hopes. It's also a time when we may fail to understand the utter futility of seeking fame and riches. The things we learn in our youth are most easily remembered. And when we get older, 
things become harder and harder. It is often said that youth is wasted on the young. For this reason, Solomon says, remember now, not tomorrow, not next week, remember now that I created in the days of my youth, while well, the evil days come not, or the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now is the time. That's all we have to use now. Jeremiah himself was called to God's service at a time when he considered himself yet a child. It says in Jeremiah 1, verses 6 and 7. But he soon learned to put away childish things. In Lamentations 3.28, he says, He sitteth alone and keepeth silence, because he hath borne it upon him. Jeremiah was to be deemed a distinct and a very sad life. And finally he was told, told not to return to them in Jeremiah 15 verse 19. We also are commanded to be separate from the race of the world. And we do this because God has laid that burden upon us. But our aims and our attitudes must be different the world. In the 29th verse, it says, He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so there be, there may be hope. This shows complete subjection to humility. Jeremiah was a man so subdued in obedience that he could bear whatever God would lay before him without complaint. Because he truly had hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him, and he filleth full with reproach. We can't help but compare this with Christ's teachings in Matthew 5, the 39th verse. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever smiteth thee on the right cheek, turn unto him the other also. Then back to limitations, for the Lord will not cast off forever. Here is the key to the world. The gospel of the kingdom is the hope of Israel. Israel will not be cast off forever, and neither will God's people. Spiritual Israel. But though he cause grief, yet he will have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict ourselves willingly, or grieve children of men. Trials and afflictions, brothers and sisters, are necessary, as we're enduring now. But it gives God no pleasure. Neither does the death of the wicked give him pleasure. It says in Ezekiel, For he is not willing that any should perish, but it is necessary to vindicate God's holy name. He will be gracious to those who love him, but he must of necessity be vengeful on those who reject him. Who is he that saith and it come to pass when the Lord commanded it not? There's no thing, there's no thing such as good luck or bad luck for the saints. Everything in our life is in God's hand and according to His will. In the 38th verse, Out of the mouth of the Most High perceiveth not evil and good. For God's work are all done in goodness. He controls His events to benefit Israel and is the one elect. Although this may not always be discernible to us, Sometimes we may receive evil in the sense of misfortune for a time. But we're told it will not be above what we can endure. We can also know here that God is the author of evil. It doesn't come from a little guy with a pitchfork. But it is God giving direction and instruction through evil and punishment. Therefore doth a living man complain, a man, for the punishment of his sins. No, brother and sisters, this is a living man. 
the word is living. Wherefore doth a living man complain? We who were once far off among the Gentiles, dead in our trespasses and sins, have been made alive. We've been made alive unto Christ and are now sons and daughters of God. We must, we must endure chastening. Can we ever complain of what we would have been if God had not called us to the truth? There is no real misfortune for the child of faith. There is no ultimate evil except unrepentant sin. Let us, as Paul did, glory in our tribulation, knowing that tribulation work of patience. Mm -hmm. Let us search our ways and turn to God again. This brother and sister is self-examination. Search and try our ways. At first, we may only see our misfortune. So oh, poor me. We've all done it. And then we call upon God for deliverance. And then we can begin to see the light. We begin to see God's mercies in our life. Everywhere there is suffering, and it will happen to us. We must understand that our sufferings are temporary, and that they are for a purpose. Remember when you corrected your child, and you said, this is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me? That was correction and instruction at the same time. And it was true. It hurt the parent more than it hurt the child. It should have. It's correction. We didn't want to do it, but it was mandatory. Next, let's look for a few minutes at Noah. What was his trial? And what did he learn from that trial? Jonah, we know, was called by God to warn them that if they did not repent from their wickedness in 40 days, they would destroy it. Now, Nineveh was Israel's enemy, and Jonah thought, well, if they repented, that'd be a great uh, danger to Israel, who was at that time very wicked. It appears that Jonah was considering this, and then he decided, uh, I don't really want to do that. I'll go to Tarshish instead of Nineveh believing that by doing that, he was probably going to help his people. He may even save them from destruction that would come from Nineveh. Even on the storm-tossed ship, when he realized that the hand of God was in the fury of the waves that engulfed the ship, he sought death rather than the help an enemy who would ultimately destroy Israel. He sought death. That's how fervently his belief was. So he pleased with the mariners, mariners to throw him overboard. And he said to them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm for you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest come upon you. So we know that Jonah was thrown into the sea, into the raging sea. And he sank down into the bottom among the weeds. We can only imagine him at the point of drowning. And he prayed to God. And God sent a huge fish that swallowed him up alive. We know that Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And this frightening experience caused him to faint. We're told in Jonah 2, verse 7. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came unto me in my holy temple. When he prayed to God, God caused the fish to bond him out on dry land. This was a miracle that saved Jonah's life. But what a trial to go through. Not something any of us can relate to this day. Now, Jonah was a man of sign, as were there many of the other prophets. What they endured in their lives sent messages to others. And it should send that same message to us. God wants us to preach his word. And we can't run away from that responsibility. The house has been built, brothers and sisters. 
the responsibility to keep it running and do that maintenance work has been handed down in this last generation to us. Are we ready to undertake this work? And if not, why not? We've had time. Are you willing and able to carry on the work of the prophets in spite of any trials that you have to endure? Are you ready? Are you ready?